الحمد لله رب العالمين الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد فهذا هو المجلس الأول من هذه المجالس التي سنذكر فيها بإيجاز إن شاء الله تعالى قصة قارون كما ذكرها الله جل وعلا في آخر سورة القصص والله سبحانه ذكر في أول السورة قصة موسى عليه السلام مع فرعون وذكر في آخر السورة قصة قارون فلا بد كما نبهنا أن يكون مع كل حاضر مصحف حتى تحصل المتابعة إلا اللهم إذا كان حفظك قويا وكنت تستحضر الآيات من غير نظر في المصحف فلا بأس. So this is the first part in a, in a uh, series, short series inshallah, where we're going to mention in brief the story of Qarun and the benefits that the story contains. And Allah subhanahu mentioned in the beginning of Surah Al-Qasas as Allah mentioned it in the end of Surah Al-Qasas because Allah mentioned in the beginning of Surah Al-Qasas the story of Musa alayhi salam with Fir'aun. And then at the end of the Surah he mentioned the story of Qarun. And so as we said, you have to bring a mushaf to these uh, lessons so you can follow along and know what we're explaining unless Allahumma you have strong memory you are you have the surah memorized and you can uh, recall the ayat that we're talking about from memory in that case then there's no harm فنقول وبالله التوفيق إن الله سبحانه وتعالى قد اشتمل كتابه على أخبار الأولين كما قال تعالى نحن نقص عليك أحسن القصص بما أوحينا إليك هذا القرآن وإن كنت من قبله لمن الغافلين وقال تعالى لقد كان في قصصهم عبرة لأولي الألباب فقصص القرآن أحسن القصص لأنها لأمور لأنها حق لا كذب فيها بوجه فهي أبعد شيء عن الخرافات والأساطير المشتملة على الكذب والمبالغات ولجلالة معانيها وحسن سياقها وإعجازها ولما تضمنته من الحكم والفوائد والعبر التي تزكو بها النفوس وتكمل بها العقول ولما تضمنته من ذكر أهل الخير وأهل الشر وأوصاف كل فريق وما فعل الله بهم مما يدل على صفات كماله وعظيم حكمته إلى غير ذلك And so we say, وَبِاللَّهِ التَّوْفِيقِ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, His book, includes accounts of the previous nations, accounts of the previous generations. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, we narrate to you the best of narration. Through that which we have revealed to you of this Qur'an, although you were before it among the unaware. And he also said to Allah, Indeed, in their stories is a lesson for people of understanding. And so the stories of the Qur'an are the absolute best stories for a number of reasons. Of them is because they are absolute truth. And there's no lies 
or falsehood in it in any way. And so it is the furthest thing from fake tales and myths which consist of, which include uh, lies and exaggerations. And they're also the best stories because of the significance of their meanings and because of the completeness of its style and because it's unequaled and unparalleled and because of what they include of lessons and, and morals and benefits and wisdoms which purify your soul and complete your intellect. And also because of what, in, of what it includes of the mention of the people of good and the people of evil and the characteristics of each group and what Allah did to each in a way that indicates His complete attributes, subhana, and complete and His great wisdom and other and other reasons as well. قال تعالى إن قارون كان من قوم موسى فبغى عليهم وآتيناه من الكنوز ما إن مفاتحه لتنوء بالعصبة أولي القوة إذ قال له قومه لا تفرح إن الله لا يحب الفرحين Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, as we pointed at the end of Surah Al-Qasas, Indeed, Qarun was of the people of Musa. You guys see it? Indeed, Qarun was of the people of Musa, but he transgressed against them. And we gave him of treasures whose keys would burden a group of strong men. When his people said to him, Do not rejoice. Allah does not love those who rejoice. So that's the first ayah. That's the first ayah. قَالَ تَعَالَ إِنَّ قَارُونَ كَانَ مِنْ قَوْمِ مُوسَى فَقَارُونَ مِنْ بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلِ وموسى مرسل إليه كما قال تعالى في سورة غافر ولقد أرسلنا موسى بآياتنا وسلطان مبين إلى فرعون وهامان وقارون فقالوا ساحر كذاب وهامان كان وزير كان وزير فرعون ولكن الله لم يقل إن قارون كان من بني إسرائيل بل قال إن قارون كان من قوم موسى إشارة إلى أن بينهما قرابة واختلف أهل التفسير في جهة القرابة وهي أن قارون كان كان ابن عمي موسى وروي هذا عن ابن عباس أنه كان ابن عم موسى فقارون وموسى يشتركان في الجد فهو قارون ابن يصهر ابن قاهث وهو موسى ابن عمران ابن قاهث فيشتركان في الجد الله says begins those ayat and says indeed Qarun was of the people of Musa Qarun was from Bani Israel he was from the children of Israel and Musa was sent to him among others as well as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in surah Ghafir and indeed we sent Musa with our ayat and clear authority and manifest authority to Fir'aun and Haman and Qarun. 
But they said, a magician, a sorcerer, a liar. So the point is, Qarun, uh, Musa was sent to Qarun among others. Fir'aun and Haman. And Haman was the uh, assistant of who? Fir'aun. Was the assistant of Fir'aun. However, Allah didn't say, indeed Qarun was of the people of the children of Israel, for example. But he said what? What does it say? The people of Musa, من قوم موسى. Indicating that there is a relationship between Musa and Qarun. And they, uh, the people of Tafsir differed regarding what that relationship is. Most of the people of Tafsir said, he is the son of the uncle of Musa. And so he is his cousin. So he is his cousin. And this was narrated from Ibn Abbas. The Qarun was the cousin of Musa, the son of his uncle. And so, and so they meet at the grandfather. Musa and Qarun meet at the grandfather because it's Qarun, the son of, the son of uh, Yashal, the son of Qahith. And it's Musa ibn Imran ibn Qahith. And so they have the same grandfather. قَالَتْ عَالَىٰ إِنَّ قَارُونَ كَانَ مِنْ قَوْمِ مُوسَىٰ فَبَغَىٰ عَلَيْهِمْ فَبَغَىٰ عَلَيْهِمْ أي بكثرة ماله فتكبر وتجبر واستخف بهم بسبب كثرة ماله قال قتادة رحمه الله كنا نحدث أنه كان ابن عم موسى وكان يسمى المنور لحسن صوته بالتوراة ولكن عدو الله نافق كما نافق السامري فأهلكه البغي لكثرة ماله فأهلكه البغي لكثرة ماله فالبغي هنا على هذا القول وهو قول قتادة وغيره أن بغيه كان بكثرة ماله وقيل بغيه كفره بالله وقيل بغيه لأنه كان عاملا لفرعون على بني إسرائيل فكان يبغي عليهم ويظلمهم وقيل غير ذلك Allah said what next but he فبغى عليهم but he transgressed against them he transgressed through his massive wealth. Because of the abundance of his wealth, he transgressed. And so he, he treated them, or he was arrogant and lofty towards them. And he belittled them because of what? Because of his wealth. And that was his transgression. Qatada said, we used to be told that he was the son of the uncle of Musa. And he used to be called Al-Munawwar because he had a beautiful voice in reciting the Torah. However, the enemy of Allah became a hypocrite, just like a Samiri became a hypocrite. And so his trans... And so... And so his transgression, due to his great wealth, destroyed him. And so, this then, the opinion of Qatada is that, and others as well, is that his transgression, that the ayah is referring to, فَبَغَى عَلَيْهِمْ is referring to what? Due to his wealth. Others said, no, he transgressed by disbelieving. Others said, he transgressed in that he was a worker for Fir'aun over Bani Israel, and he used to transgress against them and oppress the children of Israel. 
Eid. They said that was his transgression. And there are other opinions as well. قال تعالى وآتيناه من الكنوز ما إن مفاتحه لتنوء بالعصبة أولي القوة Allah said next and we gave him of treasures whose keys would burden a group of strong men it's mafatih would burden a group of strong men وآتيناه من الكنوز أي الأموال ما إن مفاتحه لتنوء بالعصبة أولي القوة أي مفاتح كنوزه تثقل الجماعة الأقوياء وتميلهم واختلفوا في العصبة فمنهم من قال أربعون رجلا ومنهم من قال سبعون ومنهم من قال ما بين الثلاثة إلى العشرة ومنهم من قال ما بين العشرة إلى الأربعين وقيل غير ذلك And we gave him of treasures meaning money And the mafatih, the mafatih of those treasures would burden a group of strong men and cause them to lean because it was so burdensome. They had to carry it. Those what? Mafatih. No, I, didn't, I said mafatih. And they differed regarding al-usbah, as they mentioned in the ayah. أي, that would burden a usba of strong men. Some said the usba is 40 men. Some said 70 men. Some said between 3 and 10. Some said between 10 and 40. And there are other opinions. But it's a group. It's a group. فَأَمَّا الْمُرَادُ بِلَفْضِ مَفَاتِحَهُ وَآتَيْنَاهُ مِنَ الْكُنُوزِ مَا إِنَّ مَفَاتِحَهُ ففيه قولان الأول أن المراد بالمفاتح هنا آلة الفتح جمع مفتح أي مفتاح قال الإمام البغوي رحمه الله في تفسيره ويقال كان قارون أينما ذهب يحمل معه مفاتيح كنوزه وكانت من حديد فلما ثقلت عليه جعلها من خشب فثقلت فجعلها من من جلود البقر على طول الأصابع وكانت تحمل معه إذا ركب على أربعين بغلا فإن كانت هذه المفاتيح فما بالك بالخزائن as for فهذا القول الأول وهو أن المراد بالمفاتيح أي المفاتيح as for what is intended by المفاتيح it's مفاتيح would burden a group of strong men there's two opinions in it the first is that مفاتيح is the plural of مفتح and it is the tool which opens. You guys are going to be quiet. As we said, Mafatih, the first opinion is what? Tool which opens, and that is a what? A key. A key. So, meaning Miftah, they said this is what Mafatih here is referring to. Mafatih meaning plural of plural of no Miftah Miftah and they said it's referring to a Miftah meaning a key so it's referring to the keys Al Baghawi rahimahullah said in his tafsir it is said that Qarun wherever he went he would carry the keys of his treasures and they were of metal. And then they became too heavy. And so he made them from wood. 
and when they became too heavy, he made them from the from cowskin, leather, at the length of a finger, and they would be carried with him, and they would be carried with him, and forty mules would carry them. Carry what? The keys. If that's the keys, what do you think about what he, what the keys open up? والقول الثاني أن المفاتيح هنا الخزائن أي خزائن كنوزه تثقل العصبة كقوله تعالى وعنده مفاتيح الغيب أي خزائنه قالوا كانت خزائنه تحمل على أربعين بغلا وعلى القولين فإن الله آتاه مالا عظيما. The second opinion is that مفاتح meaning خزائن like repository that which contains the treasure. Okay? So the خزائن then it, in this case it would be the plural of مفتح and Thus, they said it's referring to that which contains the treasure, the repository of the treasure. And they said this is like the statement of Allah Ta'ala, وَعِنْدَهُ مَفَاتِحُ الْغَيْبِ Meaning, خَزَائِنُ الْغَيْبِ And they said that those repositories would be carried on 40 mules. Either way, either way, Allah gave him a massive amount of wealth. Massive amount of wealth. قَالَ تَعَالَى إِذْ قَالَ لَهُ قَوْمُهُ لَا تَفْرَحْ أَيْ الصَّالِحُونَ مِنْهُمْ النَّاصِحُونَ كَمَا دَلَّتْ عَلَيْهِ نَصِيحَتُهُمْ وَعَضُوا قَارُونَ بِأُمُورٍ مِنْهَا قَوْلُهُمْ لا تفرح أي لا تبطر ولا تمرح إن الله لا يحب الفرحين أي البطيرين المرحين الذين يفرحون بما نالوا من الدنيا ولا يشكرون الله على ما أعطاهم فالفرح هنا فرح مذموم وهو فرح بطر وهو الذي يحمل صاحبه على الطغيان عند النعمة. Allah said, when his people said to him, what? لا تفرح. Do not rejoice. Who said to him? The pious people. The advisors admonished him. With a number of things. They admonished him with a number of things. The first thing is this. And they said, لا تفرح. Do not rejoice. Allah does not, indeed Allah does not love those who rejoice. Meaning, the type of rejoicing which contains pride and arrogance. Naam, some said that the one who said it to him was Musa. If قَالَ لَهُ قَوْمُهُ لَا تَفْرَحْ Some said that it is Musa who said it. You say, well, why? But it's in a plural. How is it just Musa? Because sometimes the plural sense is mentioned and it refers to a singular, a single, نعم, a single person. نعم. So they said, إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُحِبُّ الْفَرِحِينَ Allah does not love those who rejoice. Meaning, the ones who rejoice in what they have attained of the dunya and do not thank Allah for it. So it's a happiness which is accompanied with a type of arrogance and pride and haughtiness. 
And so, this happiness here is blameworthy. It's a blameworthy form of happiness, rejoicing. Because it causes you to transgress pertaining to your ni'am. The ni'am you have, it causes you to transgress. وَقَدْ تَكَلَّمَ الْإِمَامِ بِنُ الْقَيِّمْ رَحِمَهُ اللَّهِ عَنْ بَعْضِ مَا يَتَعَلَّقُ بِالْفَرَحِ وَبَعْضِ أَحْكَامِهِ وَالْمَذْمُومِ مِنْهُ وَالْمَحْمُودِ وَمَا يَكُونُ بِحَقٍ وَمَا يَكُونُ بِغَيْرِ حَقٍ فَسَنَقْرَأُ كَلَامَهُ رَحِمَهُ اللَّهِ وَهُوَ كَلَامُ النَّفِيسِ وهو هنا في أول المجلد الرابع من مدارج السالكين الإمام ابن القيم رحمه الله talked about happiness and rejoicing with something rejoicing in something and some of its rulings the rulings of rejoicing the, the praiseworthy form of it and the blameworthy form of it that which is rightful and that which is not rightful and so we're going to read his words, rahimahullah, because it's very valuable. And it's here in the first volume of, the, the, for, the beginning of the fourth volume of Madarij al-Sarikin. يقول رحمه الله والفرح لذة تقع في القلب بإدراك المحبوب ونيل المشتهى فيتولد من إدراكه حالة تسمى الفرح والسرور كما أن الحزن والغم من فقد المحبوب كما أن الحزن والغم من فقد المحبوب فإذا فقده تولد من فقده حالة تسمى الغم والحزن He says happiness or rejoicing is a pleasure which takes place in the heart when one attains that which they love and desire. He says there is a state which is a result of attaining that. Meaning if you attain something you love and desire, then there's a certain state you go through and that is called Al-Farah. That is what Al-Farah is. And As-Surur. It's called Farah, Surur. Rejoicing, being joyful, being happy. He says, just like sadness and misery is due to missing out on something you love. And so if you miss out on it, then there is a state which results and it is called sadness and misery. Yaqul, وذكر سبحانه الأمر بالفرح الأمر بالفرح بفضله وبرحمته عقيب قوله يا أيها الناس قد جاءتكم موعظة من ربكم وشفاء لما في الصدور وهدى ورحمة للمؤمنين أي ذكر الله بعد هذه الآية قل بفضل الله وبرحمته فبذلك فليفرحوا he says, and Allah Ta'ala has commanded, has commanded that one rejoices in his bounty and his mercy. After he said, O mankind, there has come to you an admonishment from your Lord and a cure for, for what is in the chests and guidance and mercy for the believers. How many things is that? Four things. Allah said after this ayah, pay attention, Allah after this ayah said, say in the bounty of Allah and in, the, and in His mercy, in that, let them rejoice. It is better than what they accumulate. يقول رحمه الله ولا شيء أحق أن يفرح به من فضل ورحمة تتضمن الموعظة وشفاء الصدور من أدوائها والهدى والرحمة 
فأخبر سبحانه أن ما آتى عباده من الموعظة التي هي الأمر والنهي المقرون بالترغيب والترهيب وشفاء الصدور هذا الأمر الثاني وشفاء الصدور المتضمن لعافيتها من داء الجهل والظلمة والغي والسفة وهو أشد ألما لها من أدواء البدن ولكنها لما ألفت هذه الأدواء لم تحس بألمها وإنما يقوى إحساسها بها عند المفارقة للدنيا فهناك يحضرها كل مؤلم ومحزن وما آتاها من الهدى هذا الأمر الثالث وما آتاها من الهدى الذي يتضمن ثلج الصدر باليقين وطمأنينة القلب به وسكون النفس إليه وحياة الروح به والرحمة هذا الأمر الرابع والرحمة التي تجلب لها كل خير ولذة وتدفع عنها كل شر ومؤلم فذلك خير مما يجمع الناس من أعراض الدنيا وزينتها أي هذا هو الذي ينبغي أن يفرح به هذا الذي ينبغي أن يفرح به قل بفضل الله وبرحمته فبذلك فليفرحوا أي هذا هو الذي ينبغي أن يفرح به ومن فرح به فقد فرح بأجل مفروح به لا ما يجمع أهل الدنيا منها فإنه ليس بموضع للفرح لأنه عرضة الآفات وشيك الزوال وخيم العاقبة وهو كطيف خيال زار الصب في المنام ثم انقضى المنام وولى الطيف وأعقب مرارة الهجران ويشبه قوله هذا ما يذكر عن عمر بن الخطاب رضي الله عنه أنه قال لو أن الدنيا من أولها إلى آخرها أوتيها رجل ثم جاءه الموت لكان بمنزلة من رأى في منامه ما يسره ثم استيقظ فإذا ليس بيده شيء He says رحمه الله There is nothing more worthy to rejoice in than bounty and mercy which consists of the admonishment and a cure for what is the sicknesses of the chest and guidance and mercy. The, the, how many things? Four things. He says, so Allah has informed that that which He has given His servants of the admonishment, which is commands and prohibitions which are paired with Targheeb and Targheeb. What is a maw'idah? What's a maw'idah? It's a translation. What's, what is it? Maw'idah is mentioning commands and prohibitions, but paired with Targheeb and Targheeb. Targheeb is the things that encourage you to do it, and Targheeb is the things that make you afraid to do it. So for example, if one says, uh, it's an obligation to establish the prayer. That's what? Command. If he says, it's an obligation to establish the prayer because indeed the first thing you will be asked about on the day of judgment is your prayer. That's a maw'idah. That's a maw'idah. Because now it's paired with something that makes you afraid. So when the commands and prohibitions are paired with something which encourages you to do it or repels you, then that's a maw'idah. The point. He says, so Allah has informed Subhana that that which He has given His servants of the maw'idah, which is commands and prohibitions which are paired with targheeb and tarheeb, and the cure, this is the second thing, the cure for what is in the chests, which includes relieving it from the sickness of ignorance, 
and darkness and misguidance and foolishness. And those are more, he's saying, and those are more painful than physical ailments. Yeah, those are more painful than physical ailments. But a lot of people have those sicknesses in their chest and they don't seem like they're in pain. What's the, what's the answer? Huh? Okay, if any. He's saying they're painful. Now, he says, however, when they have become, when they have become accustomed to these sicknesses, then they do not feel its pain. And, per- and awareness and perception of that pain only becomes stronger when one departs from the dunya. When you depart from the dunya, then you become very aware of those types of pains. And then that's when you feel that pain which resembles no pain. He says, at that point, it will perceive all the pain and misery it was in. He says, and that which he has given them of guidance. And this is the third thing. Which includes the coolness of certainty and the reassurance of the heart by it and the life of the soul by it through guidance and mercy, which is fourth thing. And mercy, which brings about every good and pleasure and repels every evil and pain, that is better than everything the people accumulate of the dunya. Meaning those previously mentioned things is better than what the people accumulate of the dunya. And that this is what one should rejoice in. And whoever rejoices in that has rejoiced in the the greatest thing one can rejoice in. Not what the people of the dunya accumulate because it is not a place to place your happiness because it is prone to deficiencies and it is about to vanish and its consequences are harmful. And it is like an imaginary thing, almost like a dream that a person sees and then it leaves him with the bitterness of separation. And what he said here resembles what is attributed to Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu that he said, if the dunya from beginning to end was given to a person and then death comes to him, he would be like someone who saw something that made him happy in a dream. Saw something that pleased him in a dream and then woke up and realize there's nothing in his hand. That's the whole dunya, when at the time of death, it all felt like a dream. يقول رحمه الله وقد جاء الفرح في القرآن على نوعين مطلق ومقيد فالمطلق جاء في الذم كقوله إن الله لا يحب الفرحين وقوله والمقيد نوعان أيضا مقيد بالدنيا ينسي صاحبه فضل الله ومننه أو نترجم المطلق أول يقول he says that rejoicing in the Quran is two types Rejoicing, as it was mentioned in the Qur'an, is two types. Mutlaq and muqayyad. Unrestricted and restricted. He says, as for the unrestricted type, where Allah says they rejoice and things like that, he says that was mentioned in a blameworthy sense. Blameworthy. As Allah said, do not rejoice. Indeed, Allah does not love those who rejoice. And his statement, إِنَّهُ لَفَرِحٌ فَخُورٌ Indeed, he is uh, exultant and boastful. يَقُولْ وَالْمُقَيَّدُ نَوْعَانِ 
هذا المطلق قال والمقيد نوعان أيضا مقيد بالدنيا ينسي صاحبه فضل الله ومنته فهو مذموم كقوله حتى إذا فرحوا بما أوتوا أخذناهم بغتة فإذا هم مبلسون He says and the restricted form something which is attached to something else He said and the restricted form is also two types That which is attached to the dunya and makes the person forget the favor of Allah the bounty of Allah and his favor that which is attached to the dunya and it makes a person forget the bounty of Allah and his favor he said that's blameworthy as Allah said hatta idha farihu bima utu farihu bima utu akhadnahum baghta fa idha hum mublisun until when until they rejoiced until they rejoiced in that which they were given what were they given the dunya allah opened up the dunya for them until they rejoiced in that which they were given we seized them suddenly with the punishment when tabihu huna li diqqat al-shaykh rahimahullah qal muqayyad bi dunya yunsi sahibahu fadl allah wa minnatahu فهذا فرح مذموم فهذا فرح مذموم لأنه قد يقول قائل أليس الإنسان مجبولا على محبة الأموال والأولاد ونحو ذلك من أمور الدنيا أليست هذه المحبة فطرية وبالأموال تقوم المصالح تقوم مصالح الإنسان فالإنسان بطبعه يسر إذا حصلت له فكيف يذم على ذلك؟ And here, notice how precise the sheikh, the imam here is in his, in his statement. He says, because we said al-muqayyad is two types. The first is that which is attached to the dunya. And it makes you forget what? The bounty of Allah and his favor. Notice how precise he is in his words. Makes you forget the bounty of Allah and his favor. Because someone may say, That's the blameworthy form of happiness, rejoicing. Because someone may say, isn't a human being naturally inclined to loving money and children and other things of the dunya? Isn't this something which is just in his fitrah? And in fact, his money helps him get his affairs together and establish his matters and his affairs. And so... Naturally, someone would be happy if they attain something like that because that's how you establish your affairs. So how is that blameworthy? Understood? والجواب أن الفرح المذموم بالدنيا هو الذي ينسي صاحبه فضل الله ومنته ويلهيه عن ذكر الله والأعمال الصالحة وأما السرور بشيء من الدنيا الذي لا تترتب عليه مفسدة كأن تنسيه ذكر الله ومنة الله أو تحمله على البطر والمرح فهذا سرور ليس بمذموم هذا سرور ليس بمذموم كما قال في قصة عمر بن سلمة لما قدموه للصلاة وكان غلاما قال فقدموني بين أيديهم وأنا ابن ست أو سبع سنين وكانت علي بردة كنت إذا سجدت تقلصت عني فقالت امرأة من الحي ألا تغطوا عنا استقارئكم فاشتروا لي قميصا يقول عمرو بن سلمة فاشتروا لي قميصا فما فرحت بشيء فرحي بذلك فما فرحت بشيء فرحي بذلك فالمدح والذم لا يتعلق بالسرور لذاته ولكنه بحسب ما اقترن به 
The answer, what was the question? The answer is that, is that, as Ibn al-Qayyim mentioned, that which does not make you forget the bounty of Allah and His favor, and it doesn't distract you from the remembrance of Allah and righteous actions. As for being happy in attaining something of the dunya, in which there is no evil consequence, such as making you forget the favor of Allah, or causing you to be arrogant and prideful about it, then that's not blameworthy. That's not blameworthy. And in the story of Amr ibn Salama, when he was a young boy, and they put him forward to be imam. They wanted him to lead the prayers. And he said that I was six or seven at the time. Six years old or seven years old. He said, and I had a burda that he would use to cover himself. He said, and when I would make sujood, then it would go up and my behind would be exposed. And so, meaning they were so poor that that's all he had. He had no other piece of clothing. And so a woman said, won't you cover the behind of your qari? Because he may sujood, he'd be exposed. And so they brought him a... a uh, piece of clothing, complete, a thob. And so he said, and I was never more happy with anything than that. With that garment that they brought him. The point is that he was happy with it. He rejoiced in it. And so the point is that blameworthy, uh, well, ha- rejoicing in something isn't blameworthy or praiseworthy in and of itself, but it depends on what is attached to that happiness, that rejoicing. يقول رحمه الله والثاني مقيد بفضل الله وبرحمته وهو نوعان أيضا فضل ورحمة بالسبب وفضل بالمسبب فالأول كقوله قل بفضل الله وبرحمته فبذلك فليفرحوا والثاني كقوله فرحين بما آتاهم الله من فضله فالفرح بالله وبرسوله وبالإيمان والسنة وبالعلم والقرآن من أعلى مقامات العارفين قال الله تعالى وإذا ما أنزلت سورة فمنهم من يقول أيكم زادته هذه إيمانا فأما الذين آمنوا فزادتهم إيمانا وهم يستبشرون وقال والذين آتيناهم الكتاب يفرحون بما أنزل إليك The second type which is restricted The second type is that which is attached to the bounty of Allah and His mercy. And it is also two types. That which is related to the cause and that which is related to the effect of that cause. The point, he says, and so being happy, rejoicing in Allah and His Messenger and in Iman and the Sunnah and knowledge and the Qur'an is one of the highest stations of the people of understanding. Rejoicing in what? Allah and His Messenger and Iman and the Sunnah and knowledge and Qur'an. That's what makes you happy. As He said, as Allah Ta'ala said, and whenever there comes down a surah, some of them say, meaning the hypocrites, some of them say, which of you had his faith increased by it? As for those who believed, it has increased their faith and they rejoice. Believers rejoice in the Qur'an. And he said, Allah Ta'ala said, and those whom we have given the scripture, the scripture rejoice in what has been revealed to you. وفي السنة, لم يذكره هنا رحمه الله وفي السنة قول النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم من سرته 
حسنته وساءته سيئته فهو مؤمن من سرته حسنته وساءته سيئته فهو مؤمن and also in the sunnah of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the hadith sahih he said sallallahu alayhi wa sallam whoever is happy by his good deeds and is saddened by his evil deeds he is a believer he is a believer because a hypocrite isn't saddened by his bad deeds يقول رحمه الله final final paragraph يقول رحمه الله فالفرح بالعلم والإيمان والسنة دليل على تعظيمه عند صاحبه ومحبته له وإيثاره له على غيره فإن فرح العبد بالشيء عند حصوله له على قدر محبته له ورغبته فيه على قدر محبته له ورغبته فيه فمن ليس له رغبة في الشيء لا يفرحه حصوله ولا يحزنه فواته فالفرح تابع للمحبة والرغبة انتهى كلامه رحمه الله He says رحمه الله And so rejoicing in knowledge and iman and the sunnah shows that one respects and reveres and venerates that and loves it and prefers it over other things because one rejoicing in something when attaining it is according to one's love for it and desire for it. Because one rejoicing in something when attaining it is according to one's love for it. The more you love it and want it, the happier you are to attain it. So what if you don't love it? You don't care. No, you don't care about it. You're not happy to attain it. It means nothing to you. And this is very important. He says, and so one who has no desire for something isn't, does not rejoice in attaining it, nor does it sadden him to miss out on it, nor does it sadden him to miss out on it. How many people miss out on Iman and knowledge and the Sunnah? Does it sadden them? No, not most people. He says, and rejoicing follows your love and your desire. The more you love it and desire it, the more you rejoice when you attain it. So if you want to see where your heart is, you want to test where your heart is, and what you respect and revere, look at what makes you happy. What makes you happy if you attain it? Ask yourself, where is your happiness? What do you find happiness and comfort in? You'll know where your heart is and where your love lies. So that was their first advice to Qarun. They said, لا تفرح إن الله لا يحب الفرحين Do not rejoice. Allah does not love those who rejoice. And then we're going to continue with their advice to him and how he responded to them. Insha'Allah in the coming weeks. وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه.